Hello everybody and welcome to the second series which we are now christening the glorious years. This is uh, six programmes to outline, document, go back over six of uh, Gloucestershire's trophy winning Lords finals from the period 1999 to 2004. Uh, last program we talked about the first of those wins, the Benson Hedges Super Cup. Um, today we are talking about the NatWest Trophy final victory in 1999, so the same year. Um, and uh, what better way to, um, to, to do this than be joined by three of our uh, distinguished former players who played in that match. We're very grateful to them for all joining us. Um, you know, a real nice uh, extra way to celebrate our 150th anniversary as a club. Um, our first guest then uh, in a distinguished career for the club. He bowled over 4,300 overs in first class cricket for Gloucestershire to 533 wickets in 154 matches. In list A cricket, he played 249 matches, took 296 wickets. That makes him second in the club's uh, all-time history uh, wicket takers uh, behind Mark Lane and in this Lord's final against Somerset he took three of 29 from nine overs and played a huge role in helping to defend the club's uh, total. Now obviously he was well known as a left arm swing a skiddy bowler uh, also of course representing <coughs> England. Uh, hello thanks for joining us Mike Smith. Hi there how are you? Fine, thank you very much. And yeah, you know, how, how's things? How's lockdown been for you? Um, well, still working. I haven't been furloughed, unfortunately. Um, so I'm still um, doing my employment law, practice employment law in Bristol. Been doing that for about 15 years. And um, actually, we're busier than normal because of the furlough scheme and, um, you know, the intricacies of um employing people in this kind of um scenario so i've been very busy and and do we still see you uh not this season yet but do you, do you still put on the whites do you play yeah i do play a little bit for the gloucestershire gypsies um you know chris coley's team that have a lot of uh, fixtures around uh, gloucestershire and around the country actually uh, during the summer obviously we haven't had any this year but um i try and play a few of those every year <laughs> Terrific. Well, thanks. Thanks for joining us today. Um, our second guest uh, I'd like to bring on is um, another player with a long, distinguished career at Gloucestershire for 14 years. He was uh, on the playing staff, a naturally aggressive top order batsman and an occasional bowler. And as with um, most from the squad in those years, um, a very committed, good fielder. Um, he had an excellent record in general in these Lords finals. Uh, but for this NatWest Trophy final, he top scored for the club with 74, um, which uh, actually added to many big scores he'd scored throughout the tournament that year. Um, he is still at the club, actually, as a head of Talent Pathway. Um, thank you so much for joining us, Tim Hancock. Tim, <coughs> how are you, mate? Very well, thank you, Neil. Yeah, no, going okay. And um, obviously no... no cricket yet to oversee this season but you you hopeful yeah i, I well I, yeah i'm quite hopeful I, I i haven't really like the rest of us i i, I haven't really heard a, a sort of a, a firm starting date but you know it'd be nice to get a couple of months in at the end of the season but we'll, we'll see how we go well th thanks for coming on and um i'll, I'll move on now to our third guest he, although i'm going to give him a major introduction he perhaps doesn't need it so much. Um, he, he was recently voted by Gloucestershire fans as their favourite English player in the club's history. Uh, G. Grace in the semi-final, no less. Uh, he played 431 list A matches for the club. That is the most in our history. Scored 6,080 list A runs. That's fourth in the club's history. Um, no surprise to hear he's taken the most catches and um, stumpings in clubs with 413 and 92 respectively. A decorated first class cricketer, played 54 tests and 40 ODIs for England. And a wisdom cricketer of the year in 1990. Uh, but in this particular match we're talking about, he claimed the Man of the Match award by scoring 31 not out, so three catches and one stumping, which we'll all come on to. Uh, joining us, Jack Russell. How are you, Jack? 
Neil, good to talk to you. And, and how are you? Uh, how's the painting and what are you working on at the moment? Oh, just a busy lockdown like most people. Um, but that doesn't sort of affect me too great because I'm still painting. So I'm painting most days, well, virtually every day, all day, every day. So um, just cracking on, really. And I'm still like, working on um, my pictures and ashes from last summer. But I was lucky enough to, to paint the first first day of every test so i'm just coming towards the end of that now i'm just finishing off ben stokes hitting the winning runs um at the Headley test match and uh yeah i've been busy wrapped up with that the last few months and and still lots more painting ahead so very happy oh well, well, that's good good to hear jack and um thanks all i think um where i'd like to start really is is kind of where i started in our first program it's talking about the lead up to this final because uh, the NatWest Trophy that year, this was the first year that it went from 60 overs to a 50 over format. Um, and suppose, you know, there might have been some, some differences for you as, as players. But Tim, I'm going to start with you because um, in, in that whole tournament, I mean, you had an absolute blinder. Um, so scores of 59, 54, 90, 41 and 74. So you top scored in all games that the club played in that tournament, bar one. Um, so you obviously seen it well that year, but what are the memories you have from games in the lead up? Um, I, don't, I don't remember a great deal um, before the, the, the quarter final, actually, because we had, I was sort of, I was sort of, uh, I was swatting up actually last night, and uh, we had we had a couple of very easy wins actually, which were set up by our bowlers. I think they bowled well. We played Durham cricket ball, didn't we? Who were obviously just um, they were a team of sort of league players up at Chesley Street, which did a bit anyway. And I think we skittled them out and polished them off. And then we had a really a really easy game against Derbyshire, at, you know, who are quite an awkward side, and I think we bowled them out for nothing really. Um, so it was it was very straightforward up to up to then, and then um, you know we we uh, we probably we played a really really good game at, um, at Glamorgan. We went over to Cardiff, um, and we got quite we got we we batted first over there, and it's not isn't it? They're a good side, and they're not an easy place to go and play. And um, we just kind of closed the game. We got a look. We got a good score and just closed it. Close the game out amazingly. I mean, our bowlers, you know, throughout you know, throughout the, that time were just fantastic. So, as, so as a batter, um, you know, as a batting unit, we knew if we could get a, a decent score on the board, or if we were we were never going to chase anything too major. So we 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 had amazing confidence in our sort of um, our bowling and our fielding game, I suppose, because um, they were they were they were very consistent. As Mike Smithy, uh, Smudge was, you know, he, he was pivotal to that. I think he used to bowl quite often. Smudge he used to bowl straight through, didn't you? I think at, um, I think at uh, uh, Cardiff, you bowled you bowled pretty much straight through, didn't you? Your ten overs. <laughs> Yeah, was that um, that was Jack Callis played in that game? Did he? Yeah, yeah. Is, that, is that right? And Matthew Maynard. Yeah, I do remember that. Um, I, I remember because we had some swing bowlers. I mean, not not just me. All our bowlers were pretty much swing bowlers. And um, that game, if you go away, the opposition can choose which ball they use. They can either use the juke ball, which swings a lot, or they can use the reader ball. Um, and you know me, Tim, whenever the reader ball came out and, you know, occasionally we did go to away teams and because of our swing bowlers, they did choose the reader ball, which didn't mm -hmm. swing as much. And they thought that would give them the best chance of blunting our <clears throat> attack. So, um, you know, and it, and, it, and it did to a certain extent. We couldn't swing that ball for whatever reason. Um, so I just relied on line and length in that particular game. That's really all, all I could do. It wasn't a particularly quick wicket, was it? And they had some good... They had a very strong batting lineup, actually. So I was literally just focused on trying to put every ball on the spot, and rather than to to swing it. But um, yeah, that that was a good day. Enjoyed that one. Well, your coach John Bracewell called that a perfect ten performance, um, beating De Morgan by 136 runs. Uh, we we then come to a semi final uh, at home against Yorkshire, 
who 15 days before that you'd beaten in the uh, Benson Hedges Super Cup final. Um, I, I guess, Jack, would it was? Do you remember that semi well? It was it was a close six run victory. Were you ever worried that the game had gone? Uh, <laughs> we never ever worried the game had gone because we just had a mentality um, that we would just thought if we just hold the line and stick to what we could do and do well, you know, most of the time we we could squeeze the opposition and we come out on top. Just going back to that quarter final, one thing reminds me. Reminds me uh, Tim's just said of that game there, and Smudge was right. They did have people like Callis and Maynard. They had a really good side. The preparation before the game, and we were so um, finicky and, and uh, precise about our preparation and committed. Our, our pre-match warm-ups and field in practice, it was so, they were so um, regimented and uh, top, you know, done at top speed. I remember that ground being covered with spectators. We couldn't actually do our field in practice, and I got a feeling... I don't know, I've never asked him, but I think Matt Maynard and Duncan Fletcher was the coach. Of the, I think they deliberately let the, field, let the crowd on the field at the start of play. All you had was two nets, and we couldn't do our proper fielding sessions, and I got a feeling that that was a bit of a plan from them. But And, and you were right, Smudge. It was a bit of a, uh, not a great wicket in terms of pace, and I, and, and I remember quite close and standing up to quite a, quite a lot of our guys because the wicket was re- it's reasonably down there, and we, you just bowled straight, and we just bowled it straight. Um, and we kept them down, and they had a really good side. We bowled them out cheap, which was great. And that was a really good win because somebody tried to throw us off our our mental side of our game and our preparation. So that was a very satisfying win. And when we played Yorkshire, that was a tight game um, because I was a young lad. I can't think of his name that coming in late and sweeping Alex. people over mid wicket. There was a Alex. short side over the scoreboard side, but we managed to get through. And but having beaten them in the the Super Cup a couple of weeks before, I think we were just confident and at that point my, my biggest thing about the build-up I think that Super Cup was such a big um, game for us where Mark Elaine got 100 and we won that was our first trophy in in, in a lot of years um, and I, I felt that gave us the confidence and it just gave us the belief and I remember sitting in the change room after the Super Cup and we were all chatting and everyone kept saying we got to go back we got to go back we got to come back we've got to come back to Lords and do this again and uh, luckily enough we did it in the in the, uh, the final and we went we got back but I think we got a lot of confidence from that Super Cup game, uh, Super Cup series. Well, I, I want to sort of ask about preparations for the final because, yeah, the Yorkshire game, you know, was closed out at the end by Ian Harvey uh, for the six-run win. But, you know, it was Somerset. So I suppose I, uh, two, two elements to my question, but, you know, did you prepare any differently <laughs> because it was your, you know, West Country rivals, Gloucestershire have never met Somerset before or since in a Lords final. Was that, Mike, uh, did that in any way make your preparations different or were you more nervous? Or, you know, how, how did you guys respond as a squad? I think we were pretty confident, actually, because two of those teams that we, we, we've beaten um, in the run, including Somerset, I mean, Yorkshire at that time, we always used to be. We, we had a really good record against... Um, Yorkshire. I think our preparation was always better than Yorkshire's. We did our homework a, a lot better than they did, generally speaking, um, over those years. But um, Somerset was also a team that um, we did well against at that time. I mean, it, you know, Jamie Cox, um, they had Caddick, uh, Paul Jarvis, Chris Gothic. I mean, it, it was a, a really good team, but I, I don't think, I think we were pleased with who, who we were facing in the final because of our record against them. So um, I think, like Jack said, we'd enjoyed the experience against Yorkshire so much, we just couldn't wait to get going. Well, I, I wanted to ask you, Jack, sort of, you know, when you went to Lords to, you know, for, the, for the preparation, was, did you do exactly what you did for the Yorkshire game in the, you know, in the previous final? Were there any differences in how you prepared for Somerset that morning? Well, I remember, I'll take you back to the preparation for the Super Cup final because I remember saying to John Bracer, I said, are we going to go up a few days before, John, you know, soak up the atmosphere and get used to being at Lords? You know, a lot of the guys haven't been there that often. Um, you know, we're going to, he said, no, he sort of slapped me down. He said, no, we're going to do the same preparation. We'll turn up the day before. We'll do the same routines. We'll do what our normal practice the day before. We'll turn up, we'll do the same practice on the morning. He just... He just didn't want to make a big thing about it. He just wanted to keep it at the same level and keep us in our same mental groove. I remember him saying that. So we didn't do anything different for the Somerset game, but I do remember at the team meeting, 
um, saying that I think whatever we do, and, and Mike's, Mike's right, they had a hell of a side. You know, you're looking at uh, Kerr, uh, Jarvis, uh, Caddick, Parsons, Graham Rose was a good cricketer. Their bowling attack was pretty sharp, and they had some good batters. They had uh, Bowler, Cox were the two main two, some all-rounders in the middle. Um, Parsons was a good cricketer. Uh, Robbie Turner, the keeper, was a good good player. So they were a dangerous side, and we had to be on on our best uh, performances to to <coughs> take away the trophy. So, and I remember saying to the team, I said, right, we need to get off to a good start. Whatever, and Caddick, there's every chance Caddick's going to open the bowling. So what you've got to, whatever you do, do not be nice to him on the morning of a game. Do not be pleasant to Caddick, because I, I played with him with England, and he was a sore guy. He's a lovely guy, but he likes to be your mate and like be friendly, chat to you in the morning, you know, make everything feel like cosy. And I, I to, it's the only time in my life I've ever sledged somebody before the start of play. I actually swore at him walking down the steps at Lord's, going across to the uh, nursery ground to do practice. So that was the only slight difference in, in pre-match preparation I can remember. But I've got to say, building up to the game, there was absolutely no way in my mind, and I, felt, I think the team felt it the same way, and if you, if you watch the team on the highlights or you watch the team playing the game, there's a real absolute determination in our faces because there's no way we could afford to go back down the M4 having not won that game. You know, we, there, was, there was no way that was going to happen. There's only one, going to be one winner here and it's going to be us. And, um, you know, we were so determined to do it and, and put in a good performance. And, you know, it was a tough game. It wasn't a straightforward, um, you know, they made us work hard. We got off a really good start. Tim played really well up front we came and we got we must have got 100 and something to start off and we put ourselves in a with a good platform but I think we lost wickets I think Kim got run out and we we lost wickets Tim went on to get 70 odd which was a good score and then after that we sort of like nobody got really got going in the middle and then we kept losing wickets at regular intervals that slowed us down so we sort of had to sort of work our work our socks off to get up to 230 in the end when we probably should have got more but having said that what Tim says is right. When we got a decent score, and if we got over, ever got anything over 200, we always felt, you know, we, you know, that we could do the job. Um, even with 180, we felt we had a chance. I mean, there was one a later game a year or two later with the game at uh, Worcester Road, at Worcester New Road, where we had to chase. Where we, we defended 130 odd or 40 odd in a slow. That was the replay cup match. Um, so we felt as though we got 180 or 200. We were in the game. Anything over 200 was. We felt confident because with the skills that we had with Smudge and Harv, uh, the two spin twins, Mark, um, all the guys that chipped in, Mike Cauldron in this game he played, you know, it was, we, we fell in over 200, we'd, we'd be, we were quids in, but we still had to do our stuff. And to be fair, we had them, um, if I remember rightly, 50 or 60 for like four or five and basically out of it. But then Rob Turner and Parsons, if I remember rightly, put on a big score in the middle and made life a bit tighter for us. So we had to work hard right throughout the whole game. It was an easy game, um, but we got off to good starts with bat and ball. I think Mike got Cox out early, which helped, and Bowler went out early. That was a pivotal part of the game, I think. Those two wickets early on put us in a good position. So, But it wasn't a yeah. straightforward day, game, and we had to work hard. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to dissect a, a couple of those moments, if I may. And if we, if we roll back to the start of the innings, I mean, you lost the toss, um, and we're put into bat. Um, Tim, I suppose two, two questions. Were you going to bat first anyway? And secondly, you know, did Somerset's wayward bowling at the start really help <laughs> you uh, in your innings and, and help you get off to, to, to the start, um, you know, that you could, you could kind of dream of? Yeah, we, yeah, we, we were always going to bat. It was a lovely day. And, you know, wickets at Lords, maybe, you know, it's towards the end of the season. It's quite a small square. They, they, you know they they tend to tire a little bit, so it was a no, it was a surprising decision. But having said that, Somerset um, were very good at chasing at Taunton, which was a very good wicket, small ground. They felt they could they could get anything. You know, I, I think they were very confident. They were a strong batting unit, so I can sort of understand their decision. But it it, it definitely played into our hands because we were more comfortable um, setting a target. Um, yeah, and you know, as far as the bowling, you know, I think Rose he was he was quite nervous. He 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 was a bit, you know, he bowled a few on my legs and just he was a little bit floatier than he was normally, which which is nerves really. You know, he's a, 
he's a normally a big, quite big, strong bowler, and he yeah, he was a bit. I mean, Caddick was just fairly, you know, he's metronomic and he he was very good. But Kim had a he had a very quirky technique, and he you know Caddick sort of he hits a back of a length sort of full stump, but. Kim was, they were pissing past backward point, you know, um, where I was, I was sort of leaving them, he was pissing them past there. And we <clears throat> we ran very well between the wickets, you know, me and Kim, he, he, he was, um, we had quite a good understanding. So we put real pressure on them as well. Um, so, yeah, we, we got a good start, but it, it did get a little bit harder, you know, when the... When the uh, slower, you know, Parsons just nibbles it around, and, and Kerr actually down the hill, he he was they, it was just there was always that little bit of nibble in it. So it it was one of those wickets where, um, you know, you, you, it was easy to get a little bit. I, I got out at a bad time, you know, probably you know probably fifteen overs left, and I think we probably we probably tried to get to if you see what I mean. We tried to get too many. Um, probably went a bit hard, but if we didn't go too hard, we probably would have got what we want. It was one of those days where we probably just forced it a bit um, too early. But I think Jack, you've got some runs at the end, didn't you? You, you batted well, got us up to two thirty, which which was a good score yeah. back then. With yeah, the it was. Oh, it was a good score. It was a good score for us with our bowling attack. There's no question about that. But I, I just, I, I remember the first. I think the first ball from Caddick was a wide down the leg side. And I remember the change room going, oh, that's good. Oh, that's nice. Um, you know, I, I, that sticks in my mind quite a lot. But we did, you, you gave us a good foundation. And maybe it was because the ball got slightly older and was harder to hit around and, and get, it got a bit softer um, on those, like you said, those deadening pitches later in the season. It was a little bit, maybe we just, uh, and we did go a little bit too hard. But I don't know, if you don't, if you never, you know, if you don't buy a ticket, you never know. So we sort of had enough, um, now it's about us to actually scrape a few later on that, that got us up to 230 because we lost wickets in the middle sort of guys sort of half got in and got out looked good and got like 10 or 12 or 8 or 15 or something and um, that, that sort of and we kept losing regular wickets and they, to be fair to them I think they'd settled in by then and got a bit of confidence and it was like oh right we you know they, they knew what was going on and they got used to the conditions and their nerves had gone down a little bit because Rose came back and bowled well and got wickets I think Jarvis came back and got five for, although he must have gone for 50 or 60. Um, so it, it just got a bit harder and we just scraped our way up to, I just remember thinking if we can just bat the overs, um, having lost all those wickets, you know, and, and just get as many as we can. Because I knew anything over 200, we were in the game with what the, the attack that we had. And um, Mike and the other lads proved that. Jack, I wanted to ask you because, yeah, you, you, you scored 31 not eight to sort of, um, sure up the, the end of the innings but you know we, we, we noticed that in that tournament you never batted in the same place twice uh, in that final you came in uh, number five but you batted three you batted four you batted six and seven was that a deliberate part of the preparation with the coach and the captain that you had that flexibility and how can you explain that yeah, yeah, no, that's exactly what we were because we quite we quite like left hand right hand combination. So I got a feeling that uh, the Harv, Ian Harvey and myself were 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 padded up at the same time, and I think John Brace had a theory that um, Caddick couldn't bowl very well at left handers um, from somewhere, but I actually thought he was a very good bowler <laughs> against left handers. But no, that's neither here nor there. But I just remember thinking sometimes if the bowl, opposition settled into a bit of a rhythm and they were the, in that middle, or they seemed to start doing that a bit. I think I came in just to throw in the left and right hand, and I was happy doing that. And sometimes it would be Mark Elaine or myself would both have our pads on and it, we'd say, um, right, it's the lefty next if it's a wicket or no, we were holding, depending who was bowling at the time. So we were quite flexible. I think we were really good at that. You know, we weren't that regimented um, mentally. We actually, there was quite a bit of flexibility with it. So it, as you said, it varied from game to game and depends who was bowling. Um, for some reason, John thought I could hit certain bowlers or play well against certain bowlers, so I was happy to go with it. But with the, the, we, we never... And, you know, that was the beauty of that team because I think if you look through uh, the games leading up, in fact, all that period where we were winning trophies, very rarely it was the same man of the match from game to game. It was always, you know, some, it was always a different person because everybody did their bit. I mean, to be fair to Tim... I thought his 74 really deserved money. I don't know why I was made man of the match. I got 30 odd and I got four dismissals. 
um, and we fielded really well. I suppose that might have been part of it. But the, the thing is, I mean, I think Irby should have got man and There's no question that the, the base that that gave us, that 100 odd partnership, set us up for the game really and um, put them on the back foot. And they never they never really got back into the game that much for the rest of the day. So I, I always I always feel sorry for for Tim. You should have been man of the match, mate. <laughs> Well, Tim, I think we do have a picture of you in full flow, if that's uh, any consolation whatsoever um, from that day. Um, uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll share. Um, there we go. Um, I, I suppose I'll, I, I'll come on to Mike. You know, you, you come off at the interval. Um, you know you're going to be open in the bowling. Um, how were you feeling personally? Were you, were you sort of sharing the view that you put a good score on the, on the board and, and were confident? Yeah, I think Tim Tim hit the nail on the head earlier when he said that you know the the wicket at Lords do, does die um, as the match goes on, and uh, a normal score at another ground um, is not a normal score at Lords. So um, us getting sort of two thirty was worth about three hundred. I thought that was a really good score, and I was really really confident we could defend that. Um, I think. Um, you know, one of the best decisions that John made was to bring in Ian Harvey. I mean, I don't mean that um, anything against Courtney Walsh. She was an absolutely fantastic um, servant for Gloucestershire. Um, but half, uh, what I mean is out of the players that were available to sign once, um, once it was decided that Courtney wouldn't be coming back, I know there were three or four that he had in mind. And I remember we were training at the gym one day and um, he ran through the players that he thought he wanted to bring to Gloucestershire, the overseas players, and he asked us what we thought. And the, the only one that we hadn't heard of was Ian Harvey. And there was Michael Bevan from Australia and a couple of others. And I think we, we said, oh, we don't know anything about Ian Harvey, so we can write him off. And um, I think on the Monday he'd signed him. Um, <laughs> But it was absolutely inspired. I mean, Harv was, a, you know, the best all-round cricketer I ever played with. Um, and it just gave us so much confidence. And when you've got somebody with his skills, batting, bowling, fielding, the death skills, <laughs> and you throw in, a, you know, people forget how good James Averis was at the death as well. He was, I mean, if Harv was the best in the country, Aver was certainly the second best, I would have thought. Um, he, Darren Goff up there, of course, as well. He was a brilliant death bowler, but... You know, Ava would have been in the top three in the country without a doubt. Um, so we always thought that um, we could defend totals, and especially on a dying Lord's wicket. Um, I thought we had every chance. Well, the reply from Somerset to, to, to your 2.30, um, I mean, they, they slumped to 52 for five, but perhaps the crucial wicket was their skipper, Jamie Cox, which, Mike, was your dismissal LBW. I mean... We, we have a picture of you celebrating one of your wickets that day. And I don't know, actually, if I'm honest, if this is the Jamie Cox wicket. Uh, perhaps you will. Uh, yeah, it is, yeah. yeah. We, did you, did you feel that was the crucial wicket? Um, yeah, I mean, he, he, he was one of these Australians who was a fantastic player, but wasn't good enough at the time to get in the Australian team. So he would come over to play county cricket. And he was a fairly new name to us, but... I think that year and the year before, he got hundreds of runs. I mean, he was just scoring hundreds for fun down at Taunton. Um, so, yeah, he, he, I thought he was the best wicket. And I wouldn't say they were relying on him because, as Jack said, they had some super players down the order. But certainly if we could have got rid of him early, it was a big blow for them. Um, managed to do that. I mean, I also wanted to ask you, you know, you played so much with Jack. Um, you must have um, got used to him standing up to you, of course. And... Um, you know, how, how, was, how was it with him behind the sticks? Did you have just ultimate confidence? In yeah, him? absolutely. You know, he was like having a brick wall behind the stumps. It was absolutely fantastic. I don't know whether you remember, Jack. We, we practiced it at Scarborough once, didn't we? On the square. You were... <laughs> I've still got the scar smudge. Yeah, I remember him saying, we're going to practice this um, standing up to the stumps business. And he said, come on. Uh, before the game at Scarborough once, um, he said, come running down the hill full pace and I'll see what... Anyway, this flew off a length and hit him straight in the face um, <laughs> yeah. and um, gave him a lot of stitches in his head. And you, you were carted off to hospital, Jack. I think you missed the game, didn't you? 
Yeah, I had 16 stitches on the inside and outside. But I remember Kim Barnett saying to me, I was going to look in the mirror, and he said, Jack, don't look at it because it's not pretty. But the other, there was rarely, it was, I, tell, I must have been feeling a little bit, I must have been getting old smudge. I was feeling a little bit slow, and I think I just wanted to liven up a bit. And I never really practiced stood up much to the seams at all. I just did it in the games. Um, it wasn't a thing I sort of practiced a great deal, rare, very rarely. And I remember that my hat dropped off. And I just remember bending down at Scarborough and there was this pool of blood uh, creating all around me, this large pool of blood. And there was this Yorkshire voice came from the uh, Yorkshire camp. They, they were practicing on the other side. Sod Jack, don't worry about Jack. Somebody save the hat, which was so tough. That he was more worried about my hat getting blood all over it than he was that I had to have 16 stitches on the inside and then 16 on the outside. But uh, I didn't play the game and I got cut off. Yeah, that was a rarity so much. But just ch chatting about Cox. I got a sneaky feeling, if I remember rightly, that he, he made a comment in the Bristol Evening Post or something, somewhere, about us not, none of our players being good enough to get in the Somerset team. I, and I got a feeling, somebody might correct me, but I'm sure he said that. Or it, it was either, he either did say it or John Bracewell said it, and like, that was a great piece of psychology. Um, and that sort of wound, that got us wound up. But Cox was the a key wicket, and also Peter Bowler, those two opened the innings. And with their experience, I think we got them, what, 10 or 12 for two or something, two down cheap. And that sort of like, there wasn't really much coming back from that, I don't think, from them. Not with the quality of our bowlers. And just talk quickly about Ian Arvey. We used to call him the freak, and he is a freak, because he just could do everything. He was like our free spirit. The rest of us were like regimented, disciplined, work hard. Arv, we just let, gave on half the reins, didn't we? We just, even at practice, we just let him do virtually do his own thing. Um, but he's one of the best fielders I've ever seen. He once turned up one day, and I don't know how this happened. He ran somebody out left-handed. He threw the stumps down, and I'd never seen it before. And he said, well, I've been practicing quietly on my own um, because somebody ran to his left side thinking it was a, it was a run because he was right-handed. He ran him out. That's the sort of freak he was. But he could win a game. He was a match winner. He could win a game with the ball. He bowled the best slower ball I think I've ever kept wicked to at the end. It took, took the opposition two years to work it out, and even then they still couldn't hit it. Um, and then he, with the bat, he was just like he would just take the game away from you. So I think Smudge is right. He's one of the best players I've I've ever played with. I've run out, Jack. That was um, Edgbaston. That was Ian Bell at Edgbaston. Do you remember? That, I think that was. Uh, a, I can't remember where it was. It was just yeah. I just thought, well, where the hell's that come from? Yeah, I was bowling, and he was at sort of short cover, and Ian Bell was backing up at, at my end, and he just picked it up left-handed and ran him out. I didn't even. Yeah, see Yeah, that was that was it. <laughs> The guy's a freak. Still he is. is. <laughs> we we shall ask him on one of these uh, on one of these programs to, to come. Um, I, I I just want to you know we we've talked about Somerset slump to fifty two for five. They did come back into it, um, but then probably we see the Jacks keeping to the four and um, a memorable dismissal of, of Keith Parsons uh, stumped off of you, Mike. Um, I mean, Jack, you know you won the man of the match award that day, was, was, do you remember that as one of your best ever keeping days or was it run of the mill for you? Um, oh, it, was, it was just, I was just so wound up and determined that they weren't going to win because I just couldn't face going back down the M4. I mean, I was just so um, wound up really and fired up um, in a controlled sort of way, you know. Um, but with the, for, for a keeper, it's all, if, if Mike doesn't miss the outside edge, I don't get the stump in. So if they don't, they don't bowler doesn't find the edge, I don't get the catch. So a lot of it's down to the bowler. Um, so I think they've got to take a lot of the credit. But I was just doing my job as best I could. And we'd worked out at that point that, especially on a slowish wicket um, or a dying wicket, that if I stood up, then we just, we just strangled. We just strangled the opposition. And we were really good. We just worked out that myself up to the stumps, you, we often had Martin Ball, who took a couple of good catches that day, and very important catches, um, like a wide first slip behind me. Um, that was a key part of, of our strangling the opposition together. With We had Matt Windows. Um, it was a brilliant fielder close in. Snapey was at Gully a lot. He was great there. Bawley was sometimes there. Uh, our, our, our inner field, our ring, Boo Boo was top class. He got a run out in that game, aiming at one stump. Um, you know, our fielding was just on a different level to everybody else because we actually made it a priority. I, remember, I mean, Smudge will remember, we used to have team meetings and Smudge was uh, head of the bowling department. I think Kim Barnett was batting department. I was fielding department. But we made the fielding the most important thing. 
and that was also a big part of our practice. Um, so we just became a great, we were very fit as well, mine. We were really fit. We wanted to fit, it's probably the fittest team in the country. And we just, our fielding was just on a different level to everybody else because everybody did their bit. I mean, even you saved a single at mid on it on, on occasion, Smudge. Really? I can't remember that, Jack. <laughs> yeah, you did. I mean, you, we got you to do it eventually, but you were there. No, I mean, Jack's exactly right. I mean, you know, people say there were no stars in that team. I, I, don't, I don't understand that at all because... You know, without exaggeration, we, we had the best all-rounder in the world. We had the best keeper in the world, probably the best captain in the world, and the best fielding team in the world at that time. Um, I, I don't understand the no stars bit. Um, I really don't. And, and Jack's exactly right. I mean, when John first came, he worked very hard on our fitness. Um, we, we weren't particularly fit, I've got to say, before he came. But... Yeah, I, I remember his, the first morning that he arrived, we went running 15 miles or something, which was, you know, about four, 10 times as far as we'd run before. Um, and we did get really fit. And the fielding, we did work very hard on. And we had Tim and Snapey um, uh, and Matt Windows was a fantastic fielder as well. <coughs> and Harv, of course. So, yeah, we had a lot of bases covered, it has to be said. I wanted to ask Tim, you know, from from the fielding perspective, once once you'd uh, seen off, you know, Parsons and Turner, um, and I, and I was there that day. The Gloucestershire fans obviously were in real voice uh, by this moment. Um, they'd Lords was packed and had long since sold out of Spider. Um, when you're nearing a moment of victory in a big final like that, and and, and you're out in the field, Tim, do you can you? Can you appreciate that moment? Are you listening to the crowd or are you just so focused on seeing it over the line? Yeah, look, you don't really switch. I mean, maybe towards the end when, you know, Harv had the ball in his hand and he just set Rose up for the slower ball. You, you knew it was coming. So you can sort of look around. Um, but we were focused because, yeah, um, as Jack said, you know, um, Parsons and Turner, they, they were really good competitors. And they really got, they started to get them back in that game, you know, and I wouldn't say we were starting, but from having it won to, you know, right, we've really got to dig in, you know, it, it just, but once, once I think, I can't remember who was out first, I think, I think um, Turner was out first. But I think once we got him out, I think, you know, we, we, we'd cracked them then, you know, we, we had, and, you know, and it did. I mean, we, we bowled, again, we bowled magnificently at the tops, uh, Smudge and Harv were, Fantastic, and you know when Smudge got Cox. I mean, you know, I didn't realise Smudge was so quick. To be honest, he took <laughs> off. We we're all trying to catch him, um, but he, he he was he was gone. He did tell us, you know, he used to be a you know a sprint champion at school. Right. I believe it until that point, because he he was off. Um, well, I'll tell you what was funny about that. I mean, moment that Smudge, big moment. Well, you know that Cox, uh, he didn't like the decision and. Looking back at it, he, he said he hit it and it was too high anyway. Um, I don't think he hit it first. I think he hit the pad first, in all fairness. The height was a bit uh, of an issue. I could accept that looking back at it. But in real time, it didn't look like that at all. It looked to me as if it had hit him below the knee roll and was just <laughs> absolutely stone dead. If that's what David Shepard saw, and I know poor old Shep got a bit of stick from the Somerset fans about giving that out. But if he saw the same thing that I saw, it was, and I think that's why his finger went up straight away. It looked, just looked stone dead. Um, it's only when you saw the replay that it actually was above the knee roll rather than below it. But I, I, the way I saw it, it was, it just hit him below the knee roll and just looked every inch out. And it did it, it did it, it did hit him on the back leg, Smudge. It hit him on the back leg. And I think he sort of squeezed his back against his pad. I don't think he hit yeah. it. I think the ball definitely hit the pad. And I don't think it, it was a little, it was, well, I think it was that, it was high, it was high-ish, but I, don't, I still think it would have hit the stumps, and it, but it was the back leg that did it, I think, and he was back on his stumps a little bit, and it just came back down the hill, didn't it, as you, as you normally did. Um, so I think that was a fair decision. It looked out, if, I'm glad it was out, and I felt it felt out from where I was too. Um, just times, just think, giving it out. sorry? I've watched the replay a few times, and he keeps giving it out. <laughs> yeah, that's all. I, if you check wisdom, Smudge, if you go and look, look at wisdom for that fight, it's out, LBW, mate. So it's not, I don't think we're going to lose any sleep over it, that is for sure. No. Um, but just thinking, talking like Tim says about the crowd, um, in your question about the crowd, I didn't, I don't, I was so focused, I didn't hear 
a, a lot because I was just zoned in. But I, there's one thing that just stands out, and it still gets the hairs on the back of my neck to stand up, is I remember hearing the crowd, it was sometimes during the, when we were midway through fielding, that the crowd started to sing, if you're from the West Country, stand up. And about 90% of the ground, they all stood up, and I thought, wow, that was like, cool. Even now, I mean, my knees are going like jelly. That sticks out in my mind. That right, Even to this day, that was like one of the most favorite moments of my life, just to see the whole ground come up. Um, you know, because we, we just, basically, the West Country had taken over Lords, and, uh, you know, it was just one of those magic moments. Well, yeah, I, I, I wanted to ask you all about the sort of end-of-match celebrations, because, you know, it's a 50-run victory. Uh, I think we've got a picture of the the trophy lift on the balcony. So that was obviously in the days where you could get mobbed um, as you ran off the field. Um, you know, was it starting to sink in at this point? And, and was it, bec you know, because it was Somerset, was that moment even more sweet? Tim? Uh, yeah, look, I don't think I'd have, I, I, you know, similar to Jack, really. I think the trip down the M4 would have been, would have been, it would have been a tough one to, um, to come back from, I think, because I think there was always, you know, Somerset were a, they were a good side, and I think, you know, I, I think, I don't think we were sort of acknowledged as at that stage by any means um, by being a, a really top one day side. You know, we 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 obviously won at Lords two weeks before, but it was, you know, it was, you know, you, could, you, know, you can put that down to a bit of luck and everything, but we we sort of knew differently. So I think in their mind, I think they. I'm not. I don't want to speak for them, but I think Somerset were put down as favourites, and we did. We had a friendly rivalry with them. You know, we 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 weren't. We got on. I think we got on pretty well with all of their players. And um, but I think yeah, with the crowd and you know just the whole occasion, I, I think to to have lost that game would have been would have been a really tough would have been a really tough one to take, and especially having won there before and, and knowing what it means and you know you, you can really you, I think losing a final would be would be fairly tough and it was a, it was a big occasion you know it, it, it's the it's the one of the the one that really sticks out in my mind in terms of atmosphere and the day and the um you know yeah it was a, it was a really big day and it, it was great to win it I mean I, I think it would be a supporters one of their all-time favourite moments, I suppose. Um, Mike, where, where would the achievement in this final rank for you? You obviously achieved a hell of a lot in your career, but where would you place this, this final? Yeah, I mean, just going back to your point about the supporters, um, I remember walking down to the Lord's Tavern for a drink afterwards, and there were lots of Gloucestershire supporters outside there. Um, and one lad came up to me, he, was, he must have been in his mid-twenties, and he shook my hand and said, this was, a, a, you know, well done and everything. And he actually said, this is the best day of my life. <laughs> and I thought, well, you know, that really made me think how much it, it means. I knew it meant a lot, but for the, the lad actually to say this was the best day of his life was um, really something. But, um, yeah, I mean, it, it's right up there, I think, probably my fa the favourite final. It's got to be, I think. Um, the Glamorgan one was fantastic as well. Um, great atmosphere with all the Welsh supporters coming over but um yeah i think the the cider final as it's known was was has got to be the one that sticks out in my mind and jack same question to you obviously uh, uh so much you achieved in your career and and you played in so many of these finals as well but where would this game rank for you um and your memories of it well i was i was at lords in 1977 watching gloucestershire beat kent as a kid um and i said to my my two aunties and my late brother leaving the ground said, I'm coming back here one day and I'm going to win. A, I'm going to play in a cup winning final for Gloucestershire. Now, luckily I'd done that a couple of weeks before um, when we beat Yorkshire, but this, this game sort of went to another level, I think, because I think there was a determination within the group that we just didn't want to be a one final wonder, you know, and prove it. Well, like Tim says, it just proved it wasn't luck the first one um, and sort of uh, prove our credibility um, because at that point, we'd already had a meeting saying we want to sort of win trophies and we want to do it for like 10 years. You know, we wanted to be like the Man United of, of, uh, of one day cricket. And we'd sort of set our hearts on that. So the second final was actually very important. Um, and it gave us, uh, gave us a lot even more belief than we had before. But I think, 
after that, it put it sort of put the shivers up the opposition a bit because, you know, basically we. I mean, I know what Mike's saying about world class players, but every little thing that each player did was important. Whether it was saving two down at fine leg, whether it was saving one at cover, it was bowling a dot ball, bowling your every everybody did their bit. You know, it was a what I call in my life, and I've played in a few teams. Um, away from Gloucestershire and that Gloucestershire, and I've got to say, it's the, it, that was what I call a real proper team because nobody wanted to let anybody down. And, um, for us to go back and, and double up a, a few weeks later, um, in the in the uh, after the Super Cup, and then do the Nat West was like I think that was really really special. And just chatting about the trophy because I was quite a slow changer, so by the time I'd left or finished in the change room, I was the last one there. And um, the problem was, uh, I, I got a feeling that um, the whoever was supposed to take the NatWest Trophy back to whichever part of Lords or back to Bristol, one of the committee men or whoever was in charge didn't. It was left in the change room, so it was just myself, the dressing room attendant, and the and the and the NatWest Trophy. So I thought I can't leave it here. I've got a sort of like so I put it back in its case, and I said to the attendant, I'll just put it in the back of my car, and we'll I'll take it home with me. And um, and so I had to drive home. I drove home late that night and because uh, I could never sleep. So I always used to like, we used to have a few drinks and not drink and drive. We used to have a few um, uh, in the change room. You know, the, the wives would come in and the, and the girlfriends and the families and the committees. <laughs> Once that all had been done and we'd had the, uh, the socialising in the change room, I would, I would then go off home because by the time uh, it, I got to sleep every night after a final, it was, there was no point doing it. So I used to drive home in the middle of the night. And I remember taking the NatWest Trophy home in the back of my car with all my kit. But the problem was, and Smudge used to come to my house a little bit because we used to travel together a lot. At one stage, I didn't have a, we didn't have a roof on the house, or so it was just half a roof missing. We had the builders in. And uh, so the roof, the house wasn't very secure. So I thought, what am I going to do with a NatWest Trophy? Because it's worth like about 30, 40, 50,000 pounds worth of trophy. I thought, well, there's only one option. I'm going to have to put it in bed with me. I'm going to have to sleep with the NatWest Trophy. So... Um, which my wife wasn't too happy about when she woke up next morning with this big, big lump of cold steel next to her. But it was the safest place I could put it. So in, in terms of memorable cup finals, uh, for me, beating Somerset, it, it doesn't get any more special than that. And to do it in a Lord's final was uh, amazing. And to actually spend the night with the, with the NatWest Trophy um, under my armpit was great, and uh, I mean, I, I'm like the guy you met down the tavern, Smudge. I, to me, it was certainly one of the greatest days of my life. Well, I, I can't think of a more fitting way to to end our recap over the Nat West Trophy final of 1999. And um, just on behalf of the club, we'd like to say thank you to Tim Hancock, Mike Smith, and Jack Russell for your time. It's been fantastic speaking to you and, and, and learning more about that game. Thank you very much, guys. Thanks. Pleasure. Cheers, Neil. Cheers. Thank you.